my name is Trish Greenhouse. I'm a professor of primary care health sciences at the University of Oxford. And actually, I'm now a full time academic, although for a long time, nearly 40 years, I was also a practicing clinician, um, mostly general practice, but I did also train in diabetes and I've done work in, in other conditions such as long COVID. But now I'm a full-time academic. I uh, run a, I'm the head of a research unit at Oxford called the Interdisciplinary Research in Health Sciences Unit, which is shortened to IRIS. And the kind of unique selling point of IRIS is that we are interdisciplinary, we're interprofessional. So we have doctors, nurses, pharmacists, uh, we've got a paramedic, we've got dentists, um, lots of different healthcare professionals, but also anthropologists, sociologists, computer scientists, we've got a health economist, we've got a philosopher, um, people are going to now say, why didn't you mention me, but you get the idea, uh, lots of different backgrounds and then we come together in, in a melting pot around practical challenges. We do highly applied research and we say, come on, let's get our heads around this problem, think about it in lots of different ways um, and do creative and wacky research, which is great fun. My mother tells me that I wanted to be a doctor from the age of three um, and I think that was because the kid next door had been in hospital with appendicitis and then we went round to visit him and take some gift and the kid threw up um, and it was all terribly exciting you know this vomiting kid in, in a pair of hospital pajamas and, and I thought I want a piece of that that looks really fun uh, and ever since then I wanted to be a doctor so it was before I started school and it was it was just fascination with illness and things like that. I'm ambivalent about the whole idea of branding any aspect of what I do as leadership. I've been in teams where I would question the style of the person leading. And I think many of us got into leadership and interested in leadership when we were being led in a way that we felt uncomfortable with. I've been involved in teams where leadership was very hierarchical, where leadership was really about telling people what to do and making sure that they did it and all those kind of things. And because I'm kind of a creative person and I don't like being micromanaged and all that kind of thing, um, I have tried in, in my own leadership to push back against that kind of approach to leadership. So having told you what I don't like in leadership, my approach to leadership is very simple. Hire good people and leave them alone. Um, and I can't remember who said that. So that's one thing is um, I think most people in the workplace want to do a good job. Most people, when they don't do a good job, it's because something's missing, either resources or time or training or something like that. Um, if people are happy and motivated and inspired in the workplace, then they're much more likely to do a good job. Um, and if there's dialogue in both directions, then again, then they're more likely to do a good job. Now, having said that, what you don't want is 20 people all doing a good job, but not pulling together. So there does have to be some coherence. There has to be discussion. There has to be, I'm not going to use the word shared vision because I don't think people in my unit have got a shared vision in any simple way, but we do have a broadly coherent direction with different people doing different things. Some of them are more at the margins, some of them are more central. And we are genuinely interested in others' work. We know that the, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, and we respect each other. We respect the different ways in which people um, approach a problem, uh, the complementary ways. So I, I guess the other thing about my own leadership style is it is quite female. 
female in inverted commas. I mean, you, you know, there was a was it a book? Men are from Mars, women are from Venus, or men leaders are from Mars, and you you kind of resist that, saying, "Well, hang on a minute, I'm not going. I don't necessarily have a female style just because I'm female, but actually, I think I do. And what I mean by female style is it's less hierarchical, it's more collaborative. Um, I share uncertainty. Uh, I share power, actually. Um, until very recently, I co-led the unit uh, with a colleague and for, for reasons that I needn't talk about, that colleague has now actually stepped down from co-leading and someone else is about to step up into co-leading uh, the unit. And then at some stage, I will step down and someone else will kind of job share the head of the unit. Uh, and I really like job sharing leadership. We, we job share quite a lot of principal investigator roles in research as well. We, we I pushed back to the National Institute for Health Research a few years ago when they said, well, we will allow co-PIs under exceptional circumstances and you have to make a case for it. Um, and I pushed back and said, well, have, have you ever uh, produced any evidence that a single lone hero PI does a better job than a job share PI? Because if you haven't, then can we just say that we're going to job share it? And they they said, yeah, you're right. That's perfectly fair enough. And so now we job share most of the PI roles. Uh, so that's my leadership style. Times. People are very stressed. Um, I remember when my kids were young and they um, they used to say the headmaster just sits in his office all day doing nothing. He doesn't do any teaching um, and he's a lazy whatever. And actually, I remember becoming a school governor and shadowing this headmaster who was always at his desk at seven o'clock in the morning and still there at seven at night and he was working really hard. But the kids thought he did nothing because he wasn't doing classroom teaching. And there is a bit of that around senior leadership where it appears sometimes that you've got quite a cushy job. And actually, they don't know about those financial spreadsheets that you're looking at on Sunday afternoon and all that kind of thing. So I think one of the reasons why uh, some leaders, particularly less experienced leaders, are quite autocratic is that they, they maybe subconsciously think, you know what, if I open the door a crack, there's going to be an absolute whoosh coming through of things that I'm not sure that I can deal with. I need to keep control. Um, and certainly sharing uncertainty, sharing power is something I think that you would do if you were very confident, whereas an autocratic style perhaps is something you do when, when you're less experienced and less confident. But having said that, there's plenty of autocratic leaders that have always done it that way and they're never going to change. I suppose the other thing is custom and practice. You know, when you work in a place where everybody is very hierarchical um, and where they do have a lone hero culture, then it's it's much harder to do it differently. Whereas if there's a bit more recognition and enablement of a of a more collaborative leadership style, but it does I think it takes longer actually. And actually I've already said um the, the person who's co-leading the iris unit with me recently stepped down to uh, is busy with other things. I thought I was going to have have to spend longer running the unit. I actually spend less time because we have less dialogue. <laughs> and so it's just me making decisions in this sort of temporary stopgap period. It's quicker, but I firmly believe it's not as enduring. It's not as effective. Uh, and when someone else comes back from maternity leave quite soon uh we'll be job sharing again and i look forward to it taking longer but kind of being a bit more robust when do i think a clinician's leadership journey should begin um every clinician every academic everybody every professional should have some time allocated to developing their own leadership and professional qualities. 
And as we've already alluded to, the flip side of leadership is followership um, and reflexivity on one's own role. So, you know, my son's a junior doctor and we have long conversations. We are in little WhatsApp groups separate from the rest of the family who are not doctors um in which we kind of co-reflect on situations that he's met in his clinical work obviously everything's suitably disguised and anonymized and all that kind of thing but actually i'm i'm thinking about some instance that that we've um exchanged notes on on recently maybe he's been qualified five years so quite young um it's not that he's actually a leader but he he's he's in in a hierarchy there are people below him and there are certainly people above him and then the questions are at what point do i pass this up the line um i've been put in a difficult position at what point do i um share my concerns with others and i would say that becoming a leader is, is at the beginning is partly getting your head round the position that you occupy at work um, in relation to your colleagues, in relation to the people that you are supervising, in relation to students perhaps that you're teaching, but also in relation to your line manager and the organisation as a whole. And I think developing an understanding of the way the organisation works, the way professional governance works, is really key to developing the qualities that are going to make you a leader in a few years time because it happens pretty quickly you know you on say you qualify as a doctor today in 10 years time you're probably going to be a consultant at the top of the you know I mean it seems like a long time at the time but you know it's not that long and so I think having the time and the headspace and the opportunity to discuss with a mentor what you're currently doing and, and the accountabilities and responsibilities that you've currently got is, I think, very important. Um, in terms of leadership courses, there are some excellent leadership programmes now. And I have, you know, found the funding for some of my staff to go on them. And then I've seen them confidently step up into the to the next level uh, of responsibility not just being able to do it but feeling confident that they can do it uh, so I think I think there is a definite place for leadership programs so I'm not very good at answering questions in the abstract I always have to bring it down to more concrete um, so when you ask me what are the qualities of a good leader uh, I immediately think, now hang on a minute, I need to think of a good leader and what were his or her qualities. And I recently went to the funeral of um, an academic, doesn't really matter who it, it was, but I might as well give him a mention, Ab Mitchison, who was professor of zoology at, at um, UCL for years. And I knew him as a, as a family friend. And at his funeral, all these stories came out from his, his staff and his colleagues over the years of what this guy had done and how he had done it. So there we were sitting in this funeral and hearing all these stories and thinking, oh, I really wish I'd had the privilege to, to have been working with this guy, um, you know, in my formative years. So what was it about him? And one of the things that came across from all these stories was how interested this guy was in every member of his staff. It didn't matter whether you were the tea boy or whether you were a Nobel Prize winning professor or anyone in between. He wanted to hear your story. He wanted to know about you as a person. And he also wanted to know what he could do to make your job more interesting and more fun and more doable. So that was one thing. Um, another thing which I haven't mentioned before, but I think is actually quite important, 
is that he led by example. So it's not just about line managing other people. It's also about being a role model. And actually, when um, I had one of those 360 degree feedback things uh, a few years ago, and it was one of the thing, one of the positive things that came out is that we like working in your unit because you are an example of someone who works hard, who thinks creatively, um, you know, who, who is compassionate, whatever, whatever the things were. And, and likewise, um, this example leader that I'm, I'm talking about was, was very, everybody talked about what a great role model he was. Um, I think another thing that came out about this guy was he did, when appropriate, he gave people a leg up. And there was one example of a guy who was describing, he just got his PhD, I think, and he came to work in, in this guy's lab. And the guy gave him an idea and he pursued the idea and, and produced some really interesting findings and was writing up the paper and, of course, had put his boss's name on the paper, in the draft paper. And the boss said, no, no, take my name off it because this is a really formative paper for you. And if my name goes on it, I'm going to get all the credit. Uh, and this guy said, well, you deserve some of the credit because it was your idea. And he said, oh, yeah, but I've had plenty of ideas and you did the work. And so the paper was submitted and published without the boss's name on. And sure enough, the young postdoc then got offered uh, a really good, you know, next stage job, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's, you have to be careful because you have to be honest and honorable. And if you genuinely contributed to the paper, you know, you should be on it. But I think what he was saying was, I want to avoid taking too much of the credit um, and so I, why don't you just put me as an acknowledgement? I think that's that's quite nice. And I've done that once or twice. I've reminded my postdocs, you don't have to put my name on your paper. It would be really good if you had a single author paper at this type thing. Um, so that's another quality of a good leader. Now, you, the other thing you asked me was, how can a leadership course or a leadership program inculcate these qualities? And then you think, wait a minute, the guy I'm talking about was probably born like this. He was probably born a nice guy. He was probably born quite humble and interested in people. And so you then get this fascinating question of are good leaders born or made? And of course, I think it's a bit of both. Um, but I would say that a good leadership program exposes you to examples of good leaders and good leadership. It, it gets you to know people who have good leadership in their bones, if you like. And you, role models, I think, are very, very important. But maybe the other thing a leadership program will do is it will introduce you to kind of lateral support networks. So for example, I did an MBA a few years ago and for a long time, I kept in touch with what they call your syndicate group. They put you in groups and they make you do presentations and it's all very scary. Um, and my syndicate group consisted of people very unlike me. One was a director of finance, you know, one was a dean of history, one was something else, something else. Um, so they weren't clinicians, they, they weren't like me, but they were people who were all in senior leadership positions and we supported one another. And we exchanged ideas by email and by WhatsApp. And I think building those networks is absolutely key. It gets you the soft knowledge. Um, everyone goes on about LinkedIn. I'm not on LinkedIn, or apparently I've got a profile on there, but I've forgotten my password, so I might as well not be. Um, but 
it doesn't have to be through LinkedIn. It, it can be through whatever WhatsApp groups you've got or even, you know, the face to face groups. And uh, particularly, I think, for some of the minoritized groups, um, there's a great group on on Twitter or X about black women in STEM, for example. So science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And, uh, you know, they're all black women and they face a double jeopardy, but they get a lot of support uh, from one another and from role models and, and that kind of thing. So I think that's really, really important. You asked me what the greatest leadership challenge I've faced to date and I'm not going to tell you about the greatest challenge because that involved some sensitive issues with people and it's not appropriate to talk about it. But I'll tell you about the second biggest challenge, which was when I was diagnosed with cancer nine years ago now. I had just started at the University of Oxford um, just a few months before. I'd just been awarded a big Welcome Trust Senior Investigator Award. You can puff yourself up when you've got one of those. You can kind of walk with your head high because you think, well, I've been picked by Welcome, et cetera, et cetera. And then I got the diagnosis of breast cancer. And it was actually pretty good prognosis. I mean, you can, I can say that, look, I'm still, I'm alive and haven't got any cancer now. Um, but at the time it's pretty devastating, partly because I just moved my entire team from London. Lots of people had taken their kids out of school, sold their houses, moved to a different um, city, and they were on my team ready to start on this new project which was funded for five years etc cetera, etc cetera. and I'm told right off you go and you know have surgery and chemotherapy and goodness knows what and you're likely to be off for a year um, because you've got a particular rare form that's got to have this treatment and you've got to lock yourself away because you're going to be very immunosuppressed um, so what did I do the first thing I did was um, got a co-lead for the unit so I think we were already co-leading the unit. So this was a kind of succession planning thing where someone um, came to job share and learn on the job to run the unit uh, in, in sort of by shadowing me. Um, so she took over. <laughs> so that was nice. Uh, second thing was I was up front with the Wellcome Trust and said, this is what's happened. And they said, OK, no problem. We will extend you know, the, the, we'll just let you start a few months late. Um, the third thing I did was, actually the first thing I did was, you know, talk to my husband about it and said, right, what are the priorities, et cetera, et cetera. And your health is your priority, et cetera. I shared it with my boss, my line manager, uh, Richard Hobbs, who was very good. He said, take as long as you want off sick. But really it was a question of, juggling things around, doing a little bit, keeping going, while also focusing on my treatment and the kind of existential stuff about, gosh, this could kill me, it's not likely to, but it might. Um, and I suppose coming back after treatment was quite difficult. I was exhausted. Um, I went to occupational health. They said, OK, you go back for four hours a day and then you come home and sleep in the afternoons. And this this is not me. I mean, this is not what I normally do. Um, you know, I'm normally very active. So I I had to kind of take it in hand. But I think what I was doing was building on a team that had already been very loyal to me. They'd already followed me from London to Oxford. They knew that as soon as I was well enough, I would be back. And actually they they got on with stuff. I mean, the, the, the project did take six months to get going um, because I wasn't there driving it. But people waited for me, I suppose. And, and I think what I had there was quite a big stock of forgiveness and, and stock of loyalty. Nobody left, nobody went away. Um, and they were there to help ease me back into, into the senior role. So I think, I think that went as well as it could, uh, but it wasn't fun. Okay, so this is a sort of potted advice to aspiring leaders. Um, family comes first. I would say at 
every turn in my career, when there's been a question of family or work, it's always been family. And I would say family comes first isn't just for you, but it's also for your staff. And let me give you an example. Of, and I think I put this in my application for FMLA. Many years ago, I mean, more than 20 years ago, someone told me about this idea that you could let your staff write their own contracts. And I think someone had been on a leadership course and they come along and said, you know what? There are certain requirements, like you have to be at work between 10 and three, but you can work flexible hours outside that, for example. Um, so you can't change the between 10 and three because that's your employer, you know, but, but you can say, right, what would make it easier for you to work your 37 and a half hours a week? Um, you know, someone's kind of doing the school run or whatever it might be. Um, we can adapt your contract. So a couple of people said, well, I'd like school holidays off. Um, I'll cut down to 80% or 90% if I can have most of the school holidays. I mean, we, you know, we managed to do that with some people. Obviously, you can't do that with, with all jobs. Um, but there was one, one thing I said to all staff, if you would like to cut down to less than full time um, for family reasons, either permanently or temporarily. And actually it was two men came forward. I was expecting all the women to come forward. It was two men came forward. Um, one, because he had a hobby that was taking a lot of time and the other because his wife was pregnant, but his wife earned a lot more money than him and wanted to go back to work full time pretty much immediately. And he wanted to cut down and be the primary caregiver of the baby. And we, rejig their contracts and we also got new people in to work the extra hours there were other people who wanted to increase their hours and we adapted it the guy who who cut down to half time is still working for me 22 years later the loyalty you get from your staff when you allow them to put their family first you get so much back, you get so much payback by being flexible. What that doesn't mean, by the way, is that the people without children have to work extra hours unpaid so that the people with children can spend more time with their kid. That isn't fair, and I would push back against that. This is about something a bit more nuanced than that. And, and very often these days, the family that we're talking about is an elderly relative or, you know, a sibling who's got themselves into trouble. It may not necessarily be young children, but I would say the biggest tip that I would have to run a happy, cohesive um, team is to, is to understand that people coming to work have got a life outside work and if you can make that interface easier for them they will pay you back in spades in spades several people said to me you should join fmlm because they are geared towards people who do your kind of role i suppose i partly took the plunge because of a slightly negative experience when i was <laughs> having an appraisal in a different faculty. And I was told that the example I'd given was, was too big because it was operating at national level and it was too ambitious. And really what I should be doing was go and do a small audit of some tiny bit of practice. Um, and actually, when I was a registrar, I did do small audits and they were very useful and very helpful, but that's not what I currently do. And so I'm really excited and really thrilled to, to have been accepted into the faculty. And I think the focus on leadership, the focus on not, not just sort of line managing people, but thinking strategically and trying to make the world a better place. Isn't that what leadership's about? Um, I'm really looking forward to participating in 
that kind of thing with the faculty behind me. The one government policy I would change is to prioritise the quality of indoor air. There is so much evidence that not just COVID, but other respiratory diseases such as tuberculosis, flu, measles, chicken pox are spread through the air. And if that's the case, when you walk into somewhere like a hospital, the air that you breathe may contain little particles with viruses and bacteria and other nasties. And guess what? Advances in engineering have enabled the cleaning of indoor air to a level that would prevent or greatly reduce the transmission of infections, uh, particularly in hospitals, actually. You know, I mean, you go there when you're sick. Um, maybe I'm biased because I lost a parent to hospital-acquired COVID. My mother was admitted. She didn't have COVID. When she was admitted, she caught COVID and died. But that is also the case for an awful lot of people now. I think something like 20% of all COVID is, is, is caught in a healthcare facility. Something like you'd have to you'd have to check that figure, but it's something like that. We can improve the quality of indoor air, but it is not a political priority because it would put um it would it would be expensive for government, it would be expensive for businesses, etc. 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 And just like the quality of the, the, the rivers that we swim in, um, it's not politically expedient. Uh, so people go on about, oh, you could, if you like, choose to protect yourself by wearing a mask, and you know, nobody wants to go around wearing masks all the time. But what we could do is address air quality. And I've recently been a co-author on a paper in science calling for international standards for indoor air quality. Um, the science has been done, the technology is there, uh, it, it is possible. And I think that would dramatically change um, how we react, how we would get finally get rid of COVID, which is still dragging on, but also, how we would respond to the next pandemic. Because if indoor air quality was better, we wouldn't have so many super spreader events um, and, and the transmission rates would just be, would, would be right down. If you reduce the transmission rate by just 10%, you would reduce the overall number of cases by about 40% type thing, because everything increases exponentially. Um, it, it's it's so instead of doubling, things would only increase by one point nine, and then if you do that over several generations, so so the idea that oh it wouldn't be perfect is not a reason not to do it. I, I think I put this in my application as well because uh, I told you I, was, I had a three hundred and sixty degree appraisal a few years ago, a proper one, not one of those ones where everyone just fills out an online form. I got the the the, the group, the team in the room, and. I had to go out of the room and have a coffee and they spent 40 minutes with a flip chart um, drawing a picture of me, actually. And then they were going to I was going to come back and, and they were going to tell me what they'd drawn. So I came back in and there was a picture of me running towards, you know, the, like <laughs> as if I'm towards the camera, uh, looking like Lara Croft you know, that that um, video game woman who's sort of action woman. And everybody else on the team was lying down. Um, Sparko. So I said, oh, is that the way you think of me? And they were laughing. It was all very relaxed. And I said, this is really terrifying. And they said, no, 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 we all came to work here because we really like your energy and we like um, the fact that you're clever and we like the fact that you publish a lot and do things, but we can't keep up with you. Um, and I said, well, can you just tell me one thing? You know, all these people on the ground. I said, did I knock you over? And they said, no, no, you didn't knock us over. No, no, you were trying to get, get us to carry on running with you, but we all got out of breath and so we, we had to lie down. And that was a really great bit of feedback because they were saying that it's it's a really positive thing working for someone with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. But 
I do run the unit at quite a high pace. You know, I'm always coming out with ideas. I'm always encouraging other people to come up with ideas and people get tired. And after I had that feedback, which was a few, about five years ago, a bit more, I started to introduce um, a bit of restraint to myself. <laughs> but also we started this thing where we would go away for writing weeks or a few days, writing retreats with no pressure on anyone, with no pressure. We're not having an objective. There are no objectives. We're just going to go away. I'm available from dawn till dusk. If you want to come and talk to me, that's fine. If you don't want to come and talk to me, if you just want to go for a walk or do some thinking, that's fine too. So we, we actually introduced some calm stuff, I suppose. And that's been very productive too. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Nice yeah, to meet you. Thank you very much for your time. See you Cheers, Cheers then. Bye. Nice.